Thank you very much, Leonard. And uh, thank you, Charlie Klein, for working so late 40 years ago today. Um, my note here says, slow down, so I will try to follow your instructions. Uh, I'm here to talk about the end of the internet. By the end, excuse me? Oh, no. No, there is, there is an end. Uh, and by, by end, I mean um, the physical end, the capacity limitations of the backbone of the internet. And by end, I mean what is the point, what is the purpose, so the metaphysical end of the internet. And I've been asked to talk because I was one of the founders of a company called Siena, as Dr. Kleinrock mentioned. And Siena was the pioneer in uh, a magical field called wave division multiplexing, taking light and dividing it into very, very small segments and sending it over a fiber optic network. So I'd like to tell you the story of how that uh, company began. It was in 1993. Uh, this is a story that combines a little bit of movies and engineering. I'm in Los Angeles and the engineering school, so I had to do this. Uh, there I was in a dingy little laboratory, 1993. And I had been invited by an engineer who'd just been fired, a guy named Dave Huber, to see a demonstration. Up on one wall was a screen. There was Demi Moore, a movie playing. On the other right-hand side was an Arnold Schwarzenegger a movie, The Terminator. This was back when he was an actor. Um, in front of me was an oscilloscope. And there was a little peak at about 1,380 nanometers and then a little peak a little north of there. But there was only one cable going in there, one fiber optic. Um, and I'm looking at the demonstration, seeing two movies coming out of one cable. Uh, and I asked Dr. Huber one question that, that changed my life and changed the lives of a lot of people. Um, I said, how many, theoretically, how many movies can go over a single fiber? And Dr. Huber scratched his head, and he said, approximately 100,000. 100,000 movies going over a fiber optic line simultaneously. And that answer just flabbergasted me. I knew at that moment that I had to help him get this company launched. He'd been fired from his employer, so I made a proposal to that employer that we finance the company uh, uh, through them. Thank God they turned it down. So um, I said to Dave Huber, I said, well, then maybe let's start our own company. And he agreed to do that. So I wrote the, the, the biggest, single biggest check I'd ever written in my life. It was a tremendous leap of faith, $490,000, uh, to get the company uh, launched in uh, November of 1993. And we built the first wave division multiplexing system that was a scale, sold it to Sprint. Uh, Two things happened at about the same time in 1996 when we uh, installed this first system. One was uh, Bill Clinton signed the Telecommunications Act, the Deregulation Act of 1996. It was the first act signed in cyberspace. And within a few months, uh, we launched this, this first installment uh, to Sprint. Sprint at the time was about one quarter the size uh, of AT&T, which was the largest optical backbone player. Uh, and this first wave division multiplexing system expanded that 16-fold. So in that part of the network, Sprint was now four times larger than AT&T. So it was an inversion. Uh, <coughs> the consequences of that deployment were staggering. For 25 years, the internet had sort of been sleepy. Uh, there was not much change in the capacity utilization of the fiber backbone underlying the internet. Within 10 years of that first WDM deployment, uh, the cost of transmission, wide area network transatlantic transmission, dropped 10,000 fold. The consequence of that is unlimited amounts of information are now being transmitted around the world uh, at negligible cost, almost absolute zero. Um, a little bit further on the timeline, uh, recently the um, latest demonstration by Siena was uh, for, the, for CERN laboratories uh, with the Large Hadron Collider. Uh, and they demonstrated over a single fiber uh, 
one petabyte of information. This is a world record for data transfer over an optical network. Uh, one petabyte, for those of you who are not engineers, is a lot of information. Uh, it's all the images on Facebook in 2008. If I did my math right, it's about 50 libraries of Congress. Uh, and this is over a 12-hour period, one fiber the size of a human hair. Um, one petabyte is greater than the entire world traffic on the internet for the entire year, 1995, before we installed this wave division multiplexing system. So a petabyte is an incredible amount of information. And uh, latest forecast by a uh, senior scientist at uh, Bell Labs, uh, Rod Alvernus, has estimated that in 10 years, that will increase 100-fold. It's an unfathomable amount of information going over an optical network. What is that? Five thousand libraries of Congress? I mean, it's just mind-blowing, and it's over one optical uh, network. And at that point in time, the uh, internet will be at full capacity. When we started the company, I uh, made a bold prediction, because part of my job is, as a venture capitalist is to take complex uh, subjects, uh, like wave division multiplexing and the light, light optics behind it, uh, that Dr. Huber spoke about, it was very, very complex. I called it photonese. And so I had to make a, uh, a translation. And the translation that, that we made at the time is that uh, this technology would maximize the uh, full utilization of the data superhighway. We did call it a data superhighway at that point in time. Uh, that was before the internet uh, was known. Um, so here we are, at, within the next 10 years, probably going to be maximizing the full utilization of this uh, internet. And so that's what I mean by the end of the internet in terms of physical capacity for the backbone. Um, and there's, there's the highway <laughs> going up. OK, now what I'd like to talk about is just a few minutes, uh, three things that we're doing in, in our shop to push sort of the, 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 the purpose of this. We've got this capacity. We've got this amazing, amazing infrastructure. What is the point? To what end is all this going? And that's the other end of the internet. What is, what, to what end are we, are, are we pushing this? What is the purpose? Uh, so let me tell you re, uh, three quick uh, stories uh, that apply to uh, what we're doing and what we mean. We think that, uh, uh, like Gary from Cisco, that uh, we're at just the beginning of a new renaissance in the ability to use this technology and collaborate to solve virtually any problem faster, cheaper, and better than any other way imaginable. In fact, I personally don't believe that there's any problem that we, <coughs> through collaborative systems, cannot solve. Uh, and so I'm very, very optimistic. Uh, in spite of the newspapers, in spite of what's going on, if, looking out the next uh, 10 or 20 years, I'm very optimistic about our ability to, ch to change the game. Um, so let me tell you three quick stories. Number one is uh, June this year, we were sitting down with some senior executives from IBM. They're pushing the smart cities uh, concept. And we threw out the idea of using crowdsourcing, the wisdom of crowds, to try to help them come up with unique, unorthodox uh, solutions to uh, smart cities' uh, problems. And um, so we just took a concept, congestion, which I thought you might be able to relate to here in LA, since I spent two hours in traffic getting <laughs> yesterday getting here. Um, congestion. We threw it up on one of our platforms and uh, invited people to have any ideas uh, or wanted to c contribute to, uh, you know, minimizing the air pollution or uh, the safety issues with regard to traffic, um, <clears throat> and also just the sheer frustration. I mean, the sheer human waste of being stuck in traffic. Uh, and within 60 days, this is this June. Uh, within 60 days, we had 5,000 people that were in there communicating and vetting and rating and ranking solutions that were coming up out of the community. We uh, ended up with 126 viable new ideas, new businesses, new concepts, some from large companies, small companies, startups. And um, it was very exciting to watch because this was all happening automatically. Very, very little management oversight. This was just uh, autonomously happening. Uh, uh, the winner uh, was just awarded a $50,000 um, um, uh, gift, I guess, grant by IBM in Stockholm. And it was, uh, oh, there's my definition, the end, in case <laughs> you didn't get my pun. Um, 
And the winner is uh, Lakshmi uh, Krishnamurti, who is an Indian woman who figured out a very powerful way of using a web-based system to carpool. Uh, and it was just out of sheer frustration that she developed this. And uh, she took home a $50,000 check. And uh, we got the Transportation Society uh, involved. The uh, head of the Department of Transportation personally um, uh, met her. And uh, she's got the attention of the senior management of IBM. So it's been very exciting for her to, to go from literally uh, where, wherever she was in June, to sort of the senior management. So, so that's one, one story. Uh, so, so it's sort of a, a global issue. Let me bring it down to a community issue. Uh, sa same kind of concept, but this time we were looking for new businesses. And um, the, um, we just threw out a challenge, a, a community rate and rank, produce your own ideas. And uh, the winner of our first alpha venture capital uh, showdown, we called it, was a company called We Are Us. Now, We Are Us was started um, by a retired executive from Pfizer uh, and his son, who'd graduated and couldn't find a job that was appropriate for him. So the father and son got together with a very simple idea, and that is rare diseases, rare illnesses, where there's no big drug company or big device company going to provide solutions because the FDA is you know, long and torturous path, hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, <clears throat> where, wh can we create communities for these people to share and swap what works for the, each, each other and what is uh, providing support for each other? And I would just like to read a quote from one of the members, and I think it encapsulates the whole concept of collaborative innovation and, and the power of where all this is leading us. Um, I just want you to know that this site has truly been a godsend in my life. I no longer feel alone. I'm connecting with people that can bond over things that have broken others. This site has been such an encouragement and a resource for me. It's the best thing I've found on the net. So that made me feel unbelievably good to, to see those kind of testimonials coming out of the showdown winner. Uh, the third story is, um, OK, the, sorry, there's the, there's the father and there's the son. <laughs> and you can see the, the similarity, you can, like father, like <laughs> Uh, wonderful, wonderful people. Um, OK, the third story I would like to tell you is a story about um, a Marine who retired from the Marines, uh, went to Africa, and he was struck by one thing. When the sun went down, life sort of stops. You either start a fire and breathe a lot of smoke, or you know, life stops. Uh, and so he thought, what can I, one individual, do to help bring electricity and lighting and maybe some of the benefits of, uh, of our modern uh, existence that, that we all take so for granted. But over there in, in, in Africa, you know, it's a whole different story, as, as, as we heard uh, from Nicholas Nacroponte this morning. Uh, and in a very similar way, he said, what can I do? And his idea was a very simple one. Here it is. It's called the BOGO light. It's a solar panel, LED, good for several thousand hours. You put it into the sun in the daytime and light at night. <clears throat> the, the challenge he had was how to make this for less than $10. How to make the technology configurable at a cost under $10, uh, and then how to raise $10 for you know, uh, as many people as he could. Uh, so we posted that technical challenge on another one of our platforms, a company called Innocentive. Innocentive is a leading um, open R&D uh, platform. We've got about 180,000 scientists and PhDs uh, hooked up to the system. And we have a large corporations that try to uh, uh, solve problems. And here was an individual. He got, uh, the mission was so important that the Rockefeller uh, Foundation actually uh, posted the incentive, which was a $50,000 reward. Uh, and Spencer Trask uh, chipped in. And uh, uh, a few weeks later, some young man in New Zealand came up with the technical specs that made the new and improved BOGO light um, a reality. Uh, so I think that's another example of sort of one individual going out and trying to make a difference and using global collaboration to make it economically viable. So I, I've tried to give you a sort of a, a global issue with, with traffic and congestion, a community um, issue that with the rare diseases, and then an individual issue. Um, and so that's, to me, it sort of summarizes where we're going. It's all about collaborative innovation 
It's all about getting together around missions. It's all about identifying a problem, putting an incentive, or sometimes the incentive can be just the, the sheer opportunity to contribute, uh, which is what has motivated most of these communities that, uh, uh, that, that we're seeing. So that, to me, is the end of the Internet. The, the, the purpose of the Internet is to help us solve real problems, real human problems, and it's up to each and every one of us to find a mission that, that is motivating to you and, and get out and use these tools. Um, I, I'm very excited uh, because I, I'm, I'm looking forward to coming back to the 50th anniversary uh, of the Internet and, and seeing what you have all, all have come up with. It's all a matter of taking a leap of faith, like I did when I supported Dr. Huber. Uh, it's all about taking action, like Mark Bent did when he came up with this simple idea, but it's very powerful. Thousands of children in Africa are now reading because of this simple idea. Uh, and it, it's all about uh, finding a mission that motivates you. So um, I'm looking forward to uh, being here in 10 years. Thank you very much, Dr. Clement.